Uh, my name again is Bo Landers. I'm one of our teaching pastors on staff. And as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be continuing our Fresh Fruit series, though uh, we're going to be having more, more singing here in just a moment, more being able to respond in that way in worship. But we're also going to be talking about the fruit of the spirit of goodness here. When we get into our Fresh Fruit series, what we've been talking through is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, that says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And over the past several weeks, what we've been able to do is break down each one of those, uh, those words, and each and every week taking a different passage and a, a different fruit that we're supposed to be producing, and, and sort of breaking it down in each of those sermons. And you can always catch any of those on our podcast or online, any of those from uh, John Mark, our senior pastor. But uh, again, this morning we're talking about goodness, and so as we get into this fruit of the Spirit, we first have to be able to define it. What exactly is goodness? Now, I went to Lowe's, or uh, you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot now, uh, and uh, for me, who likes to do in-home projects and things like that, they're starting to speak my language on the paint aisle, and here's why. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but here recently, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you go to the paint section, they don't have, they, I mean, they have their different brands of brushes, but um, they have uh, this particular set that has three different kinds of, of paint brushes. It literally says, good brush, better brush, best brush. Have you guys seen that right at the store? I find this incredibly helpful because in my understanding of, of good and what that means, well, in that kind of context, the good brush, I'm not going to get that. that. That means I'm cheap, right? That, that's what that means. I'm not going to get the best brush either, right? Why? Because I'm not that fancy. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to go for the, the better brush right in there. But I bring that out because truly when we begin to talk about goodness, think of good in that context. Good is now sort of a C, right? It's like a C and then you get a B or then you can get an A kind of brush. Any of you guys C students growing up? All right, or C students, don't raise your hand, all right? Your parents are in here. Uh, but yeah, so when we think of that, good in that sense almost means like average or, or satisfactory. Is that the essence of goodness? Furthermore, I think through my, my family, so I've got three kids, an eight, six, and a two-year-old. She'll be three next week. And think about that. And, and you know that pep talk that you give your kids uh, right before you go to the grocery store, you go to somebody's house. You look at them and you say, you guys have to be good, right? Sorry, <laughs> maybe not quite that voice, right? But you have some essence of where you're going in and you're saying, look. You guys need to be good. Like that becomes the kind of pep talk that you have for them. The thing is, over the years, is what I've realized is that my wife and I say the same phrase, but we mean two different things. When I say be good, basically it means this. Don't act a fool. Right? Any dads out there can testify? Don't act a fool. My wife, on the other hand, when she means be good, all of a sudden, it's a variety of stipulations. Be kind. Be considerate. Be seen and not heard. And she has all of these. And so my kids, you can naturally think, okay, their goodness, depending on which parent they're talking to, is now subjective to that parent. I want to start there because when defining what goodness is, we have to step back from our cultural understanding of what good might mean and get to the actual piece of goodness in the context of Scripture. That's the only way that we can really understand this as a fruit of the Spirit. Because goodness is not just average, goodness is the very reflection of God's purity and blamelessness and righteousness. So you'll notice on, on the sermon notes in your app or something like that, they're, they're going to be a little bit out of order. That's kind of the fuller sermon, but as we have kind of catered this a little bit more around worship, I wanted you to have that, but you'll notice on the screen, we're still going to be going over some of the same passages, and so I would encourage you to follow what is going to be presented on the screen as far as sermon points and where to go. But to begin this, I want to start by saying this, that if good is not subjective, instead this, this is your first point, good is defined first and foremost by God. Good, first and foremost, is defined by God. See, uh, when you come to the beginning of the Bible and you see God creating the world as it should be, every single day is marked by ending with this phrase of, and it was good, and there was uh, evening and there was morning, right, the fourth day or the fifth day. And so I want to pick up there because I think we begin to see exactly what goodness is in the context of Scripture all the way back in the beginning of Genesis 1 and 2. Pick it up in Genesis 1, verse 31. It says this. God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Very good. Not just good. Very good. Think This is the pinnacle, right? This is the peak of all God's creating work, and it was very good. 
A superlative is added. And there was evening and there was morning. This was the sixth day. Now, in light of that being very good, what happens? Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Now, all of a sudden, it being very good, exactly as it was supposed to be, is now tied to God's completing of his work. And then it says this, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now at the very beginning of this, we see that in God's creating work, he says it is very good and what happens next? Everything's exactly as it should be. Peace is had. And so God steps back from his creating work. He sits on his throne and he rests as a king rests over his perfectly ordered kingdom. This is what it means to be good. It's exactly as God intended. It is pure. It is blameless. It is righteous. It is holiness. It reflects the very character and nature of God that is exactly as it should be. This begins to help us understand the kind of the essence of biblical goodness. And so I want to define goodness based on this passage in this way. Goodness is this. It's the quality of everything being as it should be, as in pure, blameless, and right. And so whether we're talking about something that is good or we're talking about actions that are good, all of them are a reflection of God's goodness that we find here in a perfectly ordered, pure, blameless, and right kind of way. So it's the quality of everything being as it should be, pure, blameless, and right. The problem is, is what happens. We understand goodness in Genesis 1 and 2. Now the question becomes is, what does goodness look like now that sin has entered the world? Now that brokenness in Genesis chapter 3 has entered the world, how does this begin to, does it change our understanding of goodness, so to speak? And the answer is no, and here's the second point that I want to drive to. Because God, in his goodness, created the world in its goodness, even though sin has entered the world, God is still good. We'll get to that here in a moment. But here's your second point. Personal goodness, then, even though sin is in the world, personal goodness is determined by your closeness to God. And so when we talk about this fruit of the Spirit, here's what this means. God is the one who defines what is good. Therefore, if you want to know what is good and pure and blameless and right, you go to God. And the closer that you get to God, what happens? The more that you begin to produce his goodness. The more that you reflect his goodness. Psalm 119, 68 says it this way in kind of a succinct way. It says this, it says, you are good. Furthermore, and what you do is good. Therefore, what? Teach me your decrees. Now, this is interesting because in a very succinct way, this basically is acknowledging three different kinds of truths, right? First, you are good. And so the psalmist is coming in saying, God, you are the blameless one. You are the pure one. You are the perfect one. You aren't simply just satisfactory. You aren't good and there's not a better or a best option. Like you are good. You are the best option. You're the essence of goodness. Then he goes up and he says, that's your character and that's your nature. And here's what God does. He's not only, that's not just who he is, that's what he does. In other words, all of his actions flow from his character and nature. All of his actions flow from his goodness. Because the second point would be, what what you do is good. Meaning that everything the Lord does is what? Is in accordance to his goodness. He does not act out of bias. He he only acts in, in ways that are consistent with his good character. And then the psalmist kind of, from that, you are good in your character and nature. What you do is good in your actions. Teach me your ways. Teach me your decrees. Teach me your commands. Let me know your goodness to such an extent that I also might reflect your goodness. This becomes our guide. God becomes our guide to being good, so to speak. I want to sort of now turn to an Old Testament story that probably you're familiar with, but I think it begins to solidify this very point. 
In the book of Exodus, right, a story we're familiar with, right? You have God's people in Genesis. They get established through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You go through the storyline. They become a great nation. They're put under captivity in Egypt. But then Moses comes in. It's either Charlton Heston or uh, the Prince of Egypt, just depending on your generational gap that we have here, right? And, and so Veggie Tales is also an option, I suppose. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Got some cheers for that one. All right. However you picture Moses, all right, he was a person, not a vegetable. Just let's keep going. All right. So we have this idea of of who Moses was, and he comes and he says, let my people go. God works through him. He sends him onto the promised land. As he's headed to, as the, it, the whole nation of Israel is headed to the promised land, everything seems to be going well, right? Everything seems, you see some grumbling, you see some, uh, some problems, but then Moses goes up on the mountain, and if you remember the story, Moses goes up on the mountain, and then in Exodus 32, as Moses is receiving the commands and the word of God, what happens? He's up there for 40 days, and the Israelites look around and they're like, dude, this guy Moses ain't coming back, y'all. I got an idea. Let's make a cow, right? And so that, that, the Bible's a lot clearer on that. That's Bo's translation, okay? But we're, let's make a cow. And so all of a sudden, you get this scene where Israel, while Moses is on the mountain getting the word from God, they go in and they just, they completely rebel against the Lord. What's interesting is, is that God tells Moses, he says, hey, your people, right? That's when God looks at me, your people are doing this. They're rebelling against me. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And I'm going to restart with you. Moses then at that point steps in as a, a mediation, right? As a mediator. He comes in, he pleads on their behalf. He prays before the Lord and God spares them. There are consequences for their action, but God spares them. At the very end of that scene, Moses comes in and he asks this question. He says, God, because of all this, like, I want to see your glory, now notice what God says here. Exodus 33, we're going to pick up in the story. He says this. Moses says, I want to see your glory. And then God says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. What's interesting here is that God, Moses has to see God's glory. And what does, what does Moses do? Or what does God say? I will let my goodness. Now all of a sudden there's this correlation between glory and goodness, but that's not all. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim, proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But then he follows it up. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory, again, now you see the correlation of glory and goodness. When my glory passes by, I will place you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face you must not be seen. This correlation between God's goodness and God's glory is not accidental. And we're getting a picture. We said God defines what is good. Moses says, I want to see your glory. God says, I'll let my goodness pass before you. And then he says, but you can't see all of my goodness because if you were to see me in in all of my purity, in all of my blamelessness, in all of my righteousness, you would not be able to live. So I'm going to hide you in the rock over there. You're going to go over there. I'm going to hide it, and you'll see my backside, but you can't see me because if my goodness fully passes in front of you, you will not live. That becomes the essence of what God's goodness looks like. But you keep reading, and it gets even further because as God passes by, notice what happens in Exodus 34, 6, and 7. He passed in front of Moses. Now the scene is happening. And God proclaims this, his goodness, out of his goodness and his glory, he proclaims this as he passes by Moses. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. The essence of God's goodness rests right here. That God is so good that he is the one who is compassionate. He is the one who is gracious. He is the one who's abounding in love. He's the one who is faithful. He maintains love to thousands upon thousands of generations. But then you keep reading and it says this, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, some people come to this and they're like, well, this is the evidence of a generational curse and that still applies today or something like that. But that's not, the, that's not what the Hebrew is doing here. Instead, you see something very different. Think of the contrast for a moment between the love of God that abounds for thousands upon thousands of generations versus the justice of God that is to the third and the fourth generation. The contrast is stark, but the contrast gets us to the very essence of God's goodness. That God in his goodness, 
is more prone toward the thousands upon thousands of generations and showing love and kindness and forgiveness and being slow to anger. Yet it does not compromise his justice, but the essence of God's goodness is that he would show that to his people. It, becomes to, it comes to highlight the nature of God's goodness as he passes by Moses. But what I find most fascinating in this entire story is that as you keep reading, look at Exodus 34. What happens when Moses gets in contact with God's goodness? Verse 30, or chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, because again, this is kind of a reestablishment of it because of prior scenes, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. I used to think that Moses got some kind of sunburn up there or something like that, but that's not it at all. What happened? Moses, coming in contact with God's goodness and his glory, begins to reflect that physically to such a degree that it is visible on his face. And what does that do? Look at the next verse. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, that his face was radiant, and that they were afraid to come near him. I find that fascinating because as Moses experienced God's goodness and the purity and his righteousness and his blamelessness, and as he experienced it to such a degree that he came down from the mountain, that his face reflected the goodness of God, that when the people saw Moses' face, not even God, when they saw Moses' face, because he was reflecting the goodness of God, what happened? They were afraid because they realized that God's goodness is so great compared to their sin and badness, to say it that way. That all of a sudden, God's goodness stood in contrast to their rebellion. That God's goodness stood in contrast to who they were. See, this becomes the essence of God's goodness. And what we learn from Moses is this. The closer we get to God, the, the greater relationship we have to God, the more that we can get to know him. And now this side of what Jesus has done on the cross, the more we get to know his son, we have a permanent mediator who stands in our gap. And the more that we get to know Jesus, the more we get to know the fullness of God's goodness, the more that we will radiate his goodness in and around us. You see, Moses sets for us an example but then all of a sudden you get to the New Testament. Jesus does this permanently in establishing this mediation. He says, if you believe in me, you will know the fullness of God. And as you know the fullness of God's goodness, then you will begin to reflect that. You will begin to conform and be transformed back into my image. So therefore, what do we see? Our personal relationship to God all of a sudden affects our goodness. But as we continue worship here in just a moment, I want to go to this third point. Because I think it's important, because some people stop and say, whoa, whoa, but, but like, is God actually always good? Like, is he always, like, I get his goodness, I get what you're saying, but like, is he always good? Because if his, I feel like there's sometimes in my life where his goodness is conditional. And if his goodness is conditional, well, couldn't my goodness also be conditional? This is the third point that I want to bring out. It's this, it's that God is always good, therefore we are always called to goodness. And I want to do this through one more Old Testament story before we sing again. If you follow, continue to follow the, the Old Testament story and the, uh, where the nation of Israel goes, they, they get to the promised land, they establish a king. It, it kind of goes well for just a little bit, but then all of a sudden, right, through David, but then you get Solomon, the kingdom splits in two. They get conquered in a variety of areas. Jerusalem is ransacked. The temple is destroyed. Everything is lost because of the rebellion, because of their sin, and eventually they get put in what's called exile. And they go into exile, and they get stranded. And these people are supposed to be, this is the promise that God made. These people are supposed to be God's people. They're supposed to have God dwell in their midst. The very thing that they lost in the Garden of Eden. But now the temple has been destroyed. They've lost their identity. They're spread out throughout the land. They are no longer experiencing the blessing of being God's people. That's the exile. But at the very end of the exile, they get to come back. King of Persia reestablishes them, right, in kind of a quasi-reestablishment because he's still king. But so you can come back to Jerusalem, and they begin rebuilding. And what's interesting is when you come to Ezra chapter 3, they are rebuilding the temple. And you think about it for just a moment, like, this is what was lost. Now this happens. This should be a mountaintop kind of experience. But I find it interesting. Let's pick up in verse 10. Now they're rebuilding this temple, and this is what it says. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord... The priests in their vestments and trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, and with cymbals took their place and praised the Lord as prescribed by King uh, David, king of Israel. 
With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. What did they sing? He is good. Capturing the very essence of what we just talked about with Moses. Toward, uh, his love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. This is a mountaintop kind of experience. They're experiencing the goodness of God in its fullness as the, the foundation of the temple has been laid. They know that God is going to come back. They know that his, his temple is going to be reestablished. Yet at the same time, notice, keep reading, verse 12. But many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish between shouts for joy and sounds of weeping. I find this interesting. To many, this is a mountaintop kind of experience where God is reestablishing his relationship with his people. He's coming back. This is good. And what is their refrain? He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Yet at the same time, for some of the older people, all of a sudden you have this picture that's painted. They knew the former glory of the old temple. They knew that their rebellion and sin had been left there. They knew all of the problems that had arisen because of their sin. And they find this scene not at a mountaintop kind of experience. They find themselves deep down in the valley. They find themselves at the point of crying and weeping. Yet here's what's crazy is in both camps, whether they're on the mountain or they're down in the valley, what is their refrain? He is good. I think what we begin to learn and what we begin to capture from this passage is this thought. That sometimes in life we are on mountaintop experiences where we know the fullness of God's goodness, right? We know the fullness of God's goodness. We know his love, that he is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He is steadfast from generation to generations, and it is a good thing. Yet there are some times in our life when we're down in the valley where we can barely see his goodness, there are sometimes we're down in the valley where we don't know if goodness exists, where evil is surrounding us, where we realize the sin and we realize the brokenness that's all around us. But here can be our similar refrain. He is still good. That's the nature of our God. And our call is to reflect his goodness. My encouragement to you is that as we continue to sing, and we'll, I'll come back out here in just a moment as we uh, continue to worship and, and, and do all this, is, is to realize this, that if you want to reflect God's goodness in your life, you have to know him as good, that he truly is this God who holds all things in his hands, who is gracious, slow to anger, merciful, abounding in steadfast love, and slow to anger. That's his goodness. And if you're on a mountaintop, and you're experiencing that, I mean, you're going to have a moment here in just a second to sing his praises and to shout it from that mountaintop. But let me also say, if you're down in the valley, his goodness has not changed. Despite circumstances, despite situations, despite relationships, despite whatever may, might be happening, God's goodness remains the same. James 1.17 says as much before we close. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. What is James saying? Anything good that you have in your life is a reflection of our good God, the one who created all the way back in the beginning. He's not the one that has changed. Your circumstances might change. Your situations might change. Your relationships might change. Things around you might change. But God does not change. He is good all the time. And you have an opportunity every single moment of every single day to reflect his goodness. Let's pray together and then we'll continue singing. God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, as we continue to sing and as we continue to open your word here in just a moment, as we continue throughout this service, Lord, be present. Show us your goodness. I know many here are on a mountaintop kind of experience. They've, they've, they've seen your goodness and they've seen your faithfulness and they're able to, to shout from the top of the mountain, you are good. But God, I thank you that whether we're on a mountain or many of us might be down in this valley, where we can't barely see light, where we feel like we're surrounded, where we feel like the enemy is winning, where we feel like we don't have life, where we feel like we are surrounded by death, where we feel all of the pressures of the world. While we might shout it from the top of the mountain, I, I thank you, God, that we can also in the valley, even with a whisper, still make the same claim. That you 
are good. That your love endures forever. So God, I pray for anyone here. God, as we again continue worship and singing and responding, that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would convict us, mold us, conform us into your image, that we might reflect your goodness, but that we would also know your goodness and that you would come around us and show it to us. Lord, we do love you. God, and we thank you for this time. Be with us as we continue to worship. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.